Good afternoon and welcome to the latest MTech Access uh, Words of Wisdom webinar. Apologies, we're a couple of minutes late. We've had some technical gremlins, but I think we're we're up and running now. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't got Brent by video, uh, but we uh, we do have him on the line. Uh, this is the latest in our, our series of webinars where we're looking at different parts of the NHS, speaking with health and social mm -hmm. care leaders to get a, a window into their world, really. So I did mention Brent this a uh, month we've got Brent Kilmurray, who is Chief Executive of the Tees, Esk and Weir Valleys NHS Foundation Trust, who provide mental health, learning, disability and eating disorder services across the North East and North Yorkshire. Um, we've had some questions in advance, which I'll, I'll try and weave in, but other than that, we'll, we'll just have a bit of an exploration of what's going on in Brent's world. So Brent, welcome. Good to speak with you. Thanks, Thanks for joining Thanks, us. Tom. So, Thanks, Tom. Just... Sorry, I can't see you. That's all right, no problem. You're not missing out on much, I promise you. Um, <laughs> can, can you just very briefly give us an overview of your, your organisation and your role? Yeah. Uh, hi, everybody. My name's Brent Kilmurray. I'm Chief Executive, as, as Thomas said, at Tees Esquare Valleys, and we're a specialist mental health and learning disability and autism service provider um, across Durham, Darlington, Teesside, North Yorkshire, York and Selby. So quite a large organisation. And we are the main specialist mental health provider for, for that geography. So it's about a population of two million. Um, we cover eight local authority areas, and uh, you know a huge, a huge amount of uh, other stakeholders. So uh, it's quite a complex world that we work in. But our focus very much is about the delivery of services into local communities, uh, as well as across our inpatient estate. And we run uh, twelve inpatient sites across the area, different sizes and and purposes and functions. Um, so we're quite a significant operation uh, across ac across the, uh, the the north of England. Yeah, fantastic, thank you. And I, I think probably mental health um, services, people have lots of different perspectives of that. Can you, can you just expand a little bit more on exactly the sorts of services that you provide? Yeah, so we, we, we operate a kind of network of uh, community mental health teams. So they are specialist services and they see a range of different sort of uh, you know, psychosis based presentations, uh, anxiety and depression, you know, a variety of, uh, of other kind of what we call affective disorders um, that, that, you know, can be episodic um, or they can be sort of severe and enduring. Uh, so we can end up working with people for a long time or, or for a relatively focused piece of work. So they're, they're the, really the backbone of our services and we operate them across adult working age um, sort of uh, uh, groups, older adults, so 65 plus generally. And in those uh, uh, groups, our services are functional so that we will provide care for people who obviously have uh, sort, of, uh, sort of standard mental health presentations, but also organic disease, so dementia care, uh, memory assessment services and those sorts of things. We also operate children, children, uh, adolescent mental health uh, services and, and, and uh, learning disability services. And then, of course, we have our inpatient services, which we have access and treatment, uh, um, uh, acute wards. We have uh, some rehab services, uh, some learning disability inpatient services. And we have probably one of the biggest uh, forensics, so adult secure services in the, uh, in the north of England based on our Middlesbrough site. At Rosebury Park, so quite a quite a variety of different things that we get involved with. Uh, there. Yeah, absolutely, a huge range of different uh, sort of clinical areas, and, and a very diverse and, and complex group of, of patients as well. I I can imagine. Can you just give us a brief overview of how activity has changed for the trust through the pandemic and and impact in terms of capacity, etc. Yeah. It's been it's been phenomenal, and you know I, I spend a, a, a lot of time um, during my working week in touch with other organisations around the region, and you know talking to my acute colleagues, they've had some really intense pressures. Um, you know, obviously lots of discussions around ICU and ventilators and all that sort of thing. For us, it's a slightly different sort of um, activity that we've seen, but no less really challenging. So if I go back to wave one, what we saw pretty much immediately was a drying up of our, of our referrals, probably down to 20, 20, 20, 10 to 20 20% of what they were previously. But we also saw our capacity shrink to probably about 80%. Uh, and that was driven by sort of staff absences, you know, whether that was COVID related or other, other aspects, mainly COVID related. 
uh, that 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 was that was a factor there. So we're pretty rapidly, given I suppose the infection prevention control regulations and all the rest of it, had to really radically uh, transition into a new service model very quickly. Uh, and where we are at the moment with that, and have been since sort of March time, is that probably about 50% of our activity in the community is now virtual, and that's by means of both digital platforms and, and phone-based services. Uh, and um, we, we use the Attend Anywhere um, platform. We're probably about just about the largest or second largest user of that service in, in the country at the moment. Doing about eight thousand between eight and nine thousand uh, consultations a month uh, to attend anywhere, uh, which has seen a, a, a actually a really positive reception. So, about ninety percent of patients that have used that have, have, have indicated that they even think it's been a good or very good experience. So, that's something that pr will probably stay with us uh, in the future. Were, were, you using, in were you using much of that virtual uh, consultation previously? Very little, yeah. Very little. There would have been a bit of telephone activity. We, you know, we, 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 particularly through things like our crisis services and those sorts of things, we would have we would have run um, a, a minimal amount of telephone-based work. So that's quite a transformation for us, um, and it's enabled us obviously to work with staff who are based in their own homes, mm. uh, and um, you know, people who are shielding have been able to do that sort of work. Uh, as, as well as other members of the workforce who were kind of working flexibly between the community and our bases. Um, so that's been quite a turnaround for us. And as I say, something that I think we've learned a lot from. Uh, and I think, you know, we perceive as, uh, as being really beneficial and something that we would want to offer as a kind of hybrid approach to the delivery of community services in the future. It's not appropriate for everybody. Mm. Um, it does have its limitations. Um, but actually, in terms of having that in our locker, if you like, um, but uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an option for people to choose, uh, then we think that it's got a, 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 a sort of strong future. Yeah, absolutely. I could talk a bit. I could talk a bit about our inpatient services. Yeah, yeah, that'd be fantastic. Um, that's, that's, yeah. that, that's been a real challenge for us, um, as you could probably imagine. Um, uh, all uh, NHS services and care services are. You know, having to think about um, distancing rules and the adherence to PPE and so on and cohorting uh, of patients and how admissions are, are, are managed and testing and all of those sorts of things. So that obviously has an impact on your staffing uh, and sorry, your capacity. Uh, and um, we, we've seen that too. And one of the particular challenges about mental health has been that, you know, clearly we work with people who have got all sorts of complexities and challenges. And at times struggle to adhere to some of the, the the rules, if you like, around distancing and wearing PPE and yeah. um, you know and, and isolating and those sorts of things, and can be quite um, difficult. I suppose it would be uh, probably the pejorative way of describing it, not necessarily very PC, but it's quite a difficult sort of set of circumstances for, for staff to manage. One of the one of the features of our organisation over the last six months or so has been. A persistently high level of outbreaks in our inpatient areas and we think it's got something to do with that um, that, that you know if people are working very closely with individuals we've got people that aren't complying with the uh, the rules sometimes obviously we get into difficult situations and people need to be held in restraint and those sorts of things then there can be breaches in PPE uh, which is you know uh, ha had an impact on both patients and staff so we've definitely seen some of that we also operate across prisons. Um, so the prison services have been really difficult. And we've had some uh, challenges in terms of, I guess, differences of opinion with HM prisons about um, their stance on the use of PPE and distancing and uh, workplace risk assessments and those sorts of things. And that, again, has, has caused us some uh, difficulty and disruption in our services due to staff absence. Quite, quite a few uh, challenges that we, we've met there. Uh, and um, I have to say, I've just been absolutely bowled over by the effort of our staff, uh, yeah. their professionalism, their continued commitment, uh, and just how they've rolled with everything um, that's, that's come before. Bear in mind, of course, that you know they live in our communities. Yeah, they, yeah. They, they have to deal with this in their own lives as well as what they see at work. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds, sounds like it's been a fantastic effort. Um, we've heard a lot in the in the news about the 
potential and in some cases I think it's starting to manifest itself the uh, the impact of the pandemic on on mental health within the population is is that something that you're starting to see within the trust we are starting to, to see that I think probably the, the the starting point really is is that we've seen some different patterns of demand over the the last few months of last year or so so clearly there are those that are on our books the people with severe mental illness who uh, have had some, I guess, uh, exacerbation in their presentation, their acuity is, is, is increased. Uh, and we've seen at one point in September a tripling of demand to our crisis services, in some cases from people that we've never met before, uh, but from a lot of people that we work with who are struggling with the, you know, the broader impacts of lockdown and, and various other bits and pieces that were going on. Uh, we've seen quite a bit of first episode psychosis. So again, people that we haven't worked with before who are coming in, you know, straight to inpatients. Eating disorders is a feature, uh, an acceleration in dementia um, referrals okay. and memory assessments. And clearly the big one um, that we're worried about is, is the impact on children. Mm. Um, and um, I think that some of this is yet to be seen, but we are seeing some increase Certainly when the schools went back in September we started to see an uptick. We tend to anyway, a seasonal uptick anyway, but this was beyond that, uh, where schools and uh, other healthcare professionals were referring people into our services for assessment um, and um, and so on. We've done some modelling work, some forecasting work uh, on this, and um, obviously there's very little literature out there about global pandemics, um, but we've been able to pull on conflict data and, and, and natural disasters and some of the evidence that, that fits with those and, and, and work with other organisations and provide a bit of professional judgment on it. And the, he the headline stuff that's coming out is that we'll probably see uh, about a 24% <coughs> increase in demand for our working age adults and not, not the similar you know, older adults over and above our current demand uh, and uh, about a 50% increase for CAMS our children and young people's mental health services. Wow. So that's it's a quite a significant step up. And we think that's going to be sustained over probably about four or five years. Okay. So, that, um, so the, the object, well, the object, go on, sorry, sorry. I was just going to say, will that be sort of across the range of your services or, or, or a yeah. range of clinical presentations? We think it's going to be across the range, the, a range of services. But, you know, the things that are kind of driving that are obviously, you know, the, the, the school closures, isolation, existing health inequalities, uh, the economic impact of what's happening, um, bereavement, you know, PTSD, obviously healthcare workers, health and care workers are, are, are a concern. Um, so we think that they're all going to be features really of uh, an antecedents really to what we're, we're going to see come through. And we're starting to see some of that emerge already, not in huge swathes yet. Um, certain areas like uh, children's eating disorders are worrying um, at this stage. Uh, another aspect of CAMS, as I've mentioned, um, and, and uh, early intervention psychosis services, uh, but we, you know, we we think that this is something that's going to be sustained over a longer period of time. Are you seeing an increase in sort of alcohol and addiction service use as well? We we don't provide um, drug and alcohol services directly, so we we rely on obviously local community provision on that one. But my observation on that is that that's an increasing issue. And I think that we've got a bit of a structural challenge um, with drug and alcohol services and how, um, how how things have changed since the Lansley reforms, God knows how many years ago, six, seven, eight years ago now, um, and the, and the, and the uh, transfer of the commissioning of those services to public health. And I think what we've seen is a shift in the model of service. Uh, and uh, that has um, led to... Uh, a bit of a disconnect between mental health services and, and those uh, drug and alcohol teams uh, and a potential that people can fall down the middle and we end up sometimes with a, some of the things that come across my desk actually in terms of uh, complaints for people and incidents and things like that you see a standoff between drugs uh, drug and alcohol services and mental health services where they say well if you sort your drink, drinking and, and drug use out then we can deal with your mental health or if they say if you can get your mental health under control then we can sort out your, your drink and drugs yeah. So, you know, there's a real problem there, I think, um, that we need to, to think about how we can get better integrated services again. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I've got a couple of questions for you around that. Bef before we move on to those, though, do you think you, you as a trust 
are equipped to deal with that increase in demand, that 24% or that 50%? Not, not as things stand, but I think, I think that what, what we've got to do is to think about how we can get in front of some of this and think about how we can prevent some of that hitting our doors as a specialist provider. So how can we uh, invest some of the money that we think, you know, we, we fully expect to see? So half a billion pounds was announced, wasn't it, for mental health services before Christmas in the Chancellor's statement? Um, you know, and we've got no reason to think that that won't come our way. Um, but actually, it might be better for us to think about, can we invest some of that in provision in schools, in digital um, services, uh, uh, working with our voluntary and community sector partners, to think about whether there are alternatives that we can provide for people as they kind of, you know, um, are in earlier stages uh, of, of mental health problems uh, to allow us to uh, potentially prevent them coming to our doors. We, we will need to think about further sort of I guess improvement of our services and, and extending our capacity uh, we've got a community mental health transformation framework that's being rolled out at the moment and there's, there's some money that comes with that which allows us to increase recruitment but we need to be canny in the way that we do that and the way that we're looking to design those services is increasingly to think about you know some of the complexity that people come with so thinking about how do we uh, definitely provide them with more therapeutic uh, content, if you like, in terms of the, uh, the, the pathways that they follow with us. So better access to more of a kind of government therapy um, as part of their, their, their work with us. But also thinking about housing need, welfare and debt advice and financial support, mm -hmm. you know, uh, employment. We've got a you know, pretty good track record, actually, with uh, our, our employment uh, offer. Um, but there are a, a range of different things that obviously affect people's well-being and their ability to progress to kind of recovery um, with, their, with their mental health. And, and, and we, we now need to think more, I think, carefully about how we spend some of the investment to make sure that we can support people to get through to recovery quicker and on a more sustained basis. So we need yeah. to think differently about how we're going to meet this need. Yeah, and that, I, I suppose, does lead us back to the integration piece, doesn't it? And, and mental health historically has worked in place-based ways uh, which is, is how the rest of the nhs is, is now looking to move do you think mental health will become an increasingly important part of the system uh, in in terms of how things come together and how an area or an integrated care system looks after its population I mean, whether whether we become a more important part of the the, the system or not I, I i don't know i think that you know the the ball's in our court really around that because i think we've got a very strong offer I think that we can bring something really clear to the party on that. I mean, obviously, the, the primary care network development, I think, has been a real positive. And I think we've been really lucky with um, our PCNs, largely locally, that they are up for a conversation and they see mental health services as a, as a priority. So, you know, in most cases, we're having, you know, good discussions around how we can take that forward. But if you think about the way that mental health services work, that one of the key principles around community mental health services is around care coordination mm. and actually thinking about the holistic needs of people and we potentially haven't been that great always at meeting them but actually that's our starting point um, in what we do so if you think about that model of care then that's something that we can bring to the management and the, and the support of particularly complex individuals so I, I've worked I've previous, previous, previously joining uh, TV Square Valleys I was the chief executive of the district care trust and we, we had a, 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 a couple of pilot projects which we were just getting rolled out as I was leaving, where we were, we were looking at people who were, you know, through a population health management perspective, looking at, at GP lists, what you might call frequent flyers, yeah. and looking at a case management, a care coordination approach to how you work with some of those individuals. Some of those people had physical symptoms, but actually what was underlying them was mental health uh, mm -hmm. problems or social problems um, and what we did was we put in place a team that was led by a psychologist and it was really important that it was led by a psychologist because what they're re really good at is assessment and formulating and thinking about how you build a multidisciplinary plan around somebody and what we put into those teams was a GP, some psychology, uh, some CPN, a community, mental, a community psychiatric nurse uh, resource, some support workers, uh, Macmillan um, nurses, 
uh, and some um, some local community groups. Mm. And we were able to build packages of care around people that could get people back on their feet, so to speak, and actually to get them get them into a more sort of sustainable way of uh, of of being and work and living. And in some cases, some real success stories, getting people you know back engaged in work and and feeling well again. So you know, mental health I think has got a lot lot to offer in terms of some of the core philosophies of the way that we organize our services, but also some of the, the key clinical skills, the key, the key clinical processes uh, that, um, that, that you can bring um, to, to some of the complexities of working across systems. And, and what, so, so thinking about that, that future state, and I think PCN is a really good example with social prescribers, paramedics, other, other roles coming in there who, who might have a really important part to play for, for some of your mental health patients. What, what will, what are the big messages or what other skills that experience in mental health trusts can bring to help kind of that future service design, that, that reframing of conversations around patients? Well, I mean, like you said, we're, we're very place focused, but we're, we're much more locally focused than that. You know, we're down into, into neighbourhoods, really, aren't we, in, in, in terms of the way that we work almost street by street in some cases. So I think that's a definite advantage to having that sort of um, footprint, if you like, in terms of the way that we're organising our services. You know, working with, you know, I'm really excited by the possibilities of population health management and, you know, the, some of the data driven approaches to how we look at our our, um, our localities and think about how we can target services and I think we can play our part and think about how we can target and support some of those. The example that I've just mentioned I think is a really good one in terms of I suppose how we could potentially uh, act as a bit of a catalyst or a coordinator and again you know Tube, Tube's done this previously in the old Vanguard days um, we led a piece of work with uh, Harrogate District uh, foundation trust with the local GP groups down there. We had run, run it across three GP practices initially, but it's now it's district wide. You know where we 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 ran a service around older adults, where actually you know our focus was about keeping them out of the acute trust, but it was about making sure that we could provide them with very timely support around some dementia care, um, uh, physio support, OT, social care input. You know those sorts of things, and it was a very, it was a, a a relatively small team that just had this very connected daily approach to looking at, at people that were on the edges of society, potentially isolated or you know distant from their their loved ones who were vulnerable um, to, um, to 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 basically sort of declining in their health and then ended up in acute hospital system and care system so we were able to you know help more people be live independently or, or be sustained in their placements um, and that I think was was a real value and, and some of that, the core of that was the mental health philosophy of care coordination mm. and, I, and I think I think that, that that's been critical yeah fantastic so your your trust covers a huge area and, and you gave us some of the numbers around that how how thinking about the future of integrated care systems how do you as a trust managing an area that size across uh, however many integrated care systems, systems it will be two or three or four possibly um how do you manage to provide services both at a locally specific level but then also sort of at, at an organizational level of having a, a, a you know operating procedures and, and those sorts of things so it's a challenge tom i think it's the summary um i mean we we, we operate across two uh, icss so the northeast north cumbria and the humber coast and vale and they're two of the biggest in england yeah. um i think probably about ranking first and third um in, in terms of size uh, 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 uh and um i spend an increasingly large amount of my time working at a kind of regional level a system level uh, and obviously through the integrated care next steps document the indication is obviously that they're going to be more on a statutory basis they already are really important because that's the route that transformation funds are, uh, are directed down uh, and you know we therefore need to play our part in terms of you know those arrangements so that we can access those funds and get on and transform services 
as far as we're concerned as an organization, we're split into localities. So we try to make sure that we've got a good senior level focus around those key stakeholder relationships. So that being social care, you know, we're across uh, three police forces, um, you know, and um, uh, you know that, that can present challenges. Social care, you know, the, the school system, the police forces, et cetera, et cetera. And through that locality management, we can sort of provide a, you know, a, de a dedicated focus at the senior level. But the majority of our work, as I mentioned, is very much at a team level. And that's, that's into neighborhoods sort of style. So we've, we've got basically a, a kind of hierarchy of services that, 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 that can be very connected. And the, what, we've, what, we've, what we're trying to do is to think about how we can um, increase, if you like, the collective leadership in those areas. Clinical and managerial and operational, clinical, whatever you want to call it, uh, and um, enable give give people an agent a sense of agency and an ability to run their bit of the business on a day to day basis. Um, you know, that make and, and, and make decisions that make sense for their local context. And as an organisation, what we can do is we can provide them with a kind of key platforms, whether that's the IT, the HR, the whatever, that enables them and wraps around them, if you like, to make them you know as good as they can be and that's that's what we're trying to achieve and obviously we've got obligations around governance and we're heavily regulated uh, yeah. as, as an organization so we've got to make sure that we get a good flow if you like of data uh, that, that, that that supports that and and that's a challenge for us at the moment and we're, we're just um we just made a decision this week um about about investing in a, a new electronic patient record system a system called CETO um which you know will not only provide a better care record but will help us with some of that critical flow of data up and down the organization just very quickly on that what are some of the gaps in data that you have as a mental health trust um like uh, well we we, we 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 i think that some of the population health data and some of the the work the the work that comes out of um, some of those systems, which is driven by GP registers and those sorts of things, sometimes isn't necessarily as complete as it might be from a from a mental health perspective. I think in terms of our organisation and the uh, sorts of work that we do, I think we probably have most of the things that we need in terms of, you know, activity, uh, data and all the rest of it. Where we need to develop is on outcomes. Mm. We need to get much better on outcomes. And actually that speaks to the development of our clinical processes. So we need to, to think about when we're transforming services in the way that I've described earlier, to think about how we can build in the routine collection of good quality or good efficacy, if you like, um, outcome measures that allow us to uh, you know, direct and, 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 and refocus care uh, and will allow us to work out how effective we are as an organisation at meeting our objectives. Uh, and, you know, we've had some experience of that using, you know, uh, national uh, metrics like, you know, the SWEM, SWEM webs and the HONOS one tools. Uh, and we've had, you know, uh, some good experience with using uh, patient reported outcomes. Mm. Um, but um, I don't think that that's systematic enough for us yet. Okay. But I know it isn't. And that's something I think would really take us on. And in, in terms of those outcome measures, as as we move towards the, the integrated future, do you see the outcome measures associated with mental health changing in any way? Well, I, I mean, I think that there's, there's quite a lot of work that's already been done, but I don't think that we're quite there yet as an organisation. So I think some of the outcome measures that people use are are quite comprehensive in terms of their... So there's one called the QPR. I, I can't remember what the QPR stands for. It's not Queen's Park Rangers, I know that. <laughs> um, but um, uh, the, the QPR uh, outcome measure takes into account, it's a recovery focus, so it takes into account people's perception of their mental health improvement, but also their you know, sense of isolation or the social life, their employment, their you know, ability to, to do their daily functions, functions of daily living. You know, all of those sorts of things are captured through those so there, there exists if you like there's been lots of work done on on uh, these metrics and i think that that's probably the way that mental health services will be measured in terms of their impact in the future is those broader life impacts um uh, you know in terms of well-being 
uh, in, in the future. Whereas actually, to, to this point, some of them have been, have been quite clinical, uh, you know, and, and that, that's been, been helpful. But I don't think, you know, but even those have not been as systematically embedded as, as we might hope. Yeah. Okay. So, so thinking about the moving on from outcomes to commissioning, I suppose we've heard in in previous webinars of, of potential changes to the the health, uh, the, the physical health um, elements. Are you aware of any changes in in how you will be funded as an organisation that you can share? Well, um, I, I think that the world of commissioning is going to change with these. Uh, um, proposed moves that are, are set out in the integrated care next steps um, document which was published sort of the end of November by NHS EI and, and, and where that's headed is obviously that the, the integrated care systems are going to take a, a, a clearer role and we're going to have a single uh, clinical commissioning group at that, at that level and there's going to be more a more prominent role for provider collaboratives so actually the ICS is as commissioner will be more strategic and some of the tactical decision making uh, around the investments will be made by by providers and groups of providers probably uh, and where the discussion lies at the moment is what does that actually look like yeah so we have some experience in mental health services and we're about to go live on the first of april with a provider collaborative with our, our colleagues cumbria northumberland and Tyne and weir around some of the specialized commissioning services so they're the regional level services around adult secure services cans and adult eating disorders so we're going to have the thick end of 100 million pounds turned over to us and be given responsibility to invest it um, for outcomes um and i think that's that, that that's the direction so we're going to see a lot more of that and you know the conversations that they're having is well what what makes sense at a regional level what needs to happen across groups of similar sorts of providers what what really needs to happen in terms of, of place-based discussion so in our york discussions we're having uh conversations around well you know, is there is a potential for the acute trust and the mental health trust primary care the vcs and social care to do something jointly on that basis you know very much focused on on the, the needs of york whereas you know as i say with some of the specialist services it would be what can we do across the footprint of the North East and, and, and North Cumbria. So it's going to be horses for courses. And I see it being, you know, no less complex than we are at the moment, with some of our arrangements, but actually we're going to need to think about some of our capabilities and capacity to facilitate some of that decision making, to yep. account for some of those decisions, uh, and to manage some of the subcontracts and, and all, all those sorts of things that come through, uh, and, and, and just generally taking on that broader role as commissioning. Uh, yeah, commissioning leaders. Do, do you see that say that you, you get that 100 million pounds handed over do you see that as an opportunity to really do things differently or is it really a case of more of the same but we're just you're, you're just signing the check at the end of the day well it'd be a waste of time if if it was just more of the same and it's just a different signature on the check so you know one of, one of the opportunities around this agenda for particularly take the children and young people's aspect is that one of the wrongs that I mentioned, I've already mentioned this, I haven't got a big hang up about it, but you know, the Lansley reforms mm. was that it fragmented specialist commissioning from local commissioning. So we were having regional decisions taken about things like uh, CAMS inpatient services, uh, and then local decisions being taken around the community part of that. Mm. So by, by put, putting that back with providers, it allows people that have got oversight of that a whole pathway the possibility of actually making some sensible decisions that might mean that we can perhaps you know manage demand or create different sorts of pathways um create better transitions whatever it is you know we've got we've got the kind of insight and the ability to actually influence things in that on that basis i think that it'll move to more of a kind of planning type model rather than a straightforward commission there'd be clearly um uh, aspects of the commission process but it needs to be a bit more considered, I think, um, than some of the the, uh, the the way that commissions worked in, in the past. So I think that that's that's the potential is that we can make considered steps that that make sense that help us with the interface between different parts of pathways uh, and allow us to do that. I mean, the other thing that it allows us to do is to provide more clinical, like specialty clinical, input into some of the decision making um so we can get some real expertise uh, in there 
we've got to guard against I suppose conflicts of interest mm. so we've got to think about how we organize ourselves on that and we're we're taking steps on that basis in terms of separating out some of our governance and thinking about specific roles so lead, lead director for me around around provider collaboratives and commissioning uh, a separate committee in the organization with you know ned and ned responsible for that uh, 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 and so on so it, it's it's a real improvement, but we've got to make sure that we don't end up going native with it or, you know, yeah. basically not maximising that opportunity. And, and and from the conversations that you're having, again, without divulging uh, anything that, you, that you, you shouldn't be, are you seeing that general sort of will to, to, to make real change out of these opportunities? I, I think there's a genuine excitement um, mm. here that we've got a chance to maybe put, and, you know, and again, it's not, Telling tales out of school, but I think there's been a, a sense of frustration, mm. uh, how difficult it can be at times to break through and do the right thing or the sensible thing uh, because of this budget relating to that budget or a budget holder in you know in London or in Leeds or wherever, um, you know, not necessarily being bought into a particular way of doing things. So I think that you know, genuinely through my conversations in the northeast of North Cumbria and the Humber Coast and Vale, we see the ability to to really think about how can we bring care closer to home for people it's quite often you know people have to travel a long way for some of these services so we can develop you know better services in their own communities that maybe mean that they don't need to go into expensive inpatient settings in manchester or edinburgh or even sometimes bournemouth or wherever you know um yeah. so i i i think that we're up for it yeah fantastic that's uh, good news to hear do you think there's any role that healthcare industries could play in supporting some of your objectives? Yeah, very much so. I mean, I, I have to say, Tom, I don't think that we're particularly well connected as things stand at the moment. And I think that we need to be more open to this. You know, one of the things that we have to do that will be a duty on us uh, from April 22, we believe in the new act, is that we need to do more in terms of our local economies so in terms of our openness, if you like, to working with industries, and whilst I understand that our care industry may not be on our doorstep, I think it's a mindset thing um, that we need to work through. My organisation isn't particularly prolific in things like drug trials and, 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 and those sorts of things or research partnerships um, with, with industry, and I think there's definitely uh, scope to do that. Some organisations are better at it, but I think mental health generally is not as good as acute at maximising some of those opportunities. We've got some massive challenges we need to solve. Mm. Um, you know, where I know that the the expertise or the creative sort of, uh, I suppose, potential sit through partnerships and different ways of working. You know, how we manage our environment. You know, how do we make sure that we get maximum out of digital? Uh, how do we make sure? You know, what's the what's the efficacy of our digital platforms, and how do we you know manipulate those? You know, working alongside and think about how do we, you know, change our service model, uh, you know, and make them more effective and efficient. Uh, and thinking about, you know, that community development stuff. You know, what, what is it that we can bring? What yeah, is it that absolutely. partners can help us with? That's going to really change up, if you like, some of those dynamics in the way we provide our services. So, so nothing, I, I can't put my finger on something specific that I need <laughs> one of those now. But I think there's something about a tenor of the of the conversation, mm. uh, a need for us to be more open to discussion, a little less wary, maybe, of each yeah. other. But certainly, certainly from an NHS perspective, uh, there's always that. Well, what do they want? Uh, and uh, you know, am I going to get in trouble with procurement? Yeah. Uh, you know, and all of that sort of stuff. So a, a bit more of a maturing, if you like, of attitudes, predominantly on our side. Um, so that we can be more open to some of the possibilities and think about how we can get some, some of the benefits out of the creativity, yeah. innovation, problem-solving skills that, that I know industry can bring. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, no, no shortage of, uh, of things on your list there either. Um, yeah. In terms of lists, what are your top priorities in your role for the year ahead? Which well, probably got... change on a weekly basis, I, I, yeah. I mean, <laughs> but for now. Well, this particular Friday afternoon, I mean, you know, obviously re recovering, re you know, seeing through and recovering from the pandemic is going to be front and centre. 
um, you know, we've got to think about how we can pull through this. And there's a number of challenges in there for us. Our staff are absolutely worn out. Um, they've, you know, massively stepped up as I've talked talked before, and I think staff well-being is a is a massive concern for us. We've got some big opportunities around around. Uh, in my particular organisation, we've just reset our, our strategic framework, uh, and we're really excited about the, the potential that that brings in terms of developing a new culture in the organisation. And one of the things that sits at the core of that is this community transformation and the ability for us to perhaps change the focus of some of our community things and re really think about our role as a system player in yeah. local communities, but also a right the way up to, to kind of the region side. So that's a, that's a, that's a, a focus for us. Uh, around that and and for me one of the things that is really kind of front and center this week and next week and the week after is about how do we continue to strike the right balance between um regulation uh, and their legitimate interest uh, in needing assurance and um you know i suppose providing transparency in terms of safety services and some of the, the burdens and bureaucracy that that can and, and challenges that that can create for organizations that's something that's really topical for my organization because some bad things have happened uh, over the last few years so we're coming out of some quite challenging times and you know we continue you know just this week to have challenges around that kind of agenda uh, and we need to think about how we can really i think be fleet a foot in or, or or more canny in the way that we uh, provide assurance and that we can manage some of those real needs to make sure that our services are safe at the same time not bog our staff down with additional bureaucracy uh and, and, and all of that that goes with it and that's yeah. that's something i'm thinking about today yeah okay fantastic that's that's really useful to get an insight into your world one one very quick thing I, i'm wondering if you could follow up you talked about the pandemic recovery where do you imagine recovering to Will it be where you were before the pandemic came, or will you be recovering to a very different place as an organisation? Well, my, my, my thoughts, and you know, I'd be interested to, to hear others' thoughts on this, but my thoughts are that the world's going to be a different place, isn't it? Mm. So I think once, we, once we're through the kind of heat of this current pandemic, we know that, you know, the next the rest of the calendar year, we're going to be vaccinating people, uh, that, you know, we're going to need to be very careful about what we do in our workplaces and in the way that we deliver our services. The transformation that I talked about earlier or the transition to a new service model around digital and all those sorts of things will be a feature. We know that what's coming down the pipeline is more work, more demand for services. And I've talked about the need for us to think about as part of our recovery, thinking about investing in different ways of delivering our service, whether that is digital or those sorts of things, but also working with others who could maybe pick some of this stuff earlier so that we can perhaps protect people's well-being or intervene earlier uh, and those sorts of things but inevitably i'm going to need to recruit hundreds of people i think over the coming years and that is not an easy challenge i mean if they give me all the money i needed tomorrow i couldn't find the people to do the jobs yeah, absolutely so that's one of my big worries is that we are going to need to to move to a different way of working we are going to need to expand our capacity we've got to think about how we can do that and how we can recruit people and retain people um you know in, in, into some really challenging roles but you know equally rewarding yeah fantastic thank you very much brent i know you've got to shoot off to a, to a far more important engagement than this now so uh, <laughs> thank, thanks again for joining me I, I appreciate it's a really chaotic time for you so uh thank you everyone at home for listening as well uh, we'll be back on the 26th of february speaking with john ribchester who's the clinical director of the whistable primary care network among other things and um a real forward thinker in in the world of primary care so uh, thanks again to brent and uh we will see you again soon Bye bye. thanks tom Take care.